What's up, guys? It's your host, Hao, here, the CEO of Vietcetera. We're back in the studio, uh, which is a great sign to see. As you, many of you know, Vietnam is getting out of its COVID period and lockdown. We're all returning back to, to normal. And by that, I mean back to the office, back to the restaurants that really define and make up the identity of the city. And we're really excited to be welcoming a great guest here today. His name is Tim Evans. He's the CEO of HSBC Vietnam as our first guest back in the studio. So I'm very sure he's excited for that as well. Uh, today's show, we're going to be talking a lot about the values and the, the uh, of not only HSBC, but what their perception of the future is and what Vietnam plays in it, and what are the most important challenges and opportunities that we face here today. And we're very lucky to have someone like Tim from HSBC, which I understand has been in Vietnam for 151 years, the longest bank uh, kind of period and time in Vietnam. So a lot of insights that we can glean off that. Tim, welcome to the studio and the Viet Center office. Uh, we'd love to hear more about what you do at uh, HSBC. Well, 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 thank you very much for the introduction. I'd just like to point out for the audience that I myself have not been here 151 yes. years. So it's just uh, HSBC and, and our original office is still here um, mm. in Ho Chi Minh City or Saigon back in those days. Um, and it's uh, now in State Bank of Vietnam office. So, um, oh, the one on the river. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, that, that, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's the most a... distinctive feature of that building. I think. Okay. Yeah. So, so that is where our history um, in Vietnam started. Mm. And, you know, through all the transitions that this country has been through, we have been part of that. And I think that if we just look at the future of Vietnam, and let's just put COVID aside for a moment, I, I still think it's hugely exciting. Uh, I was fortunate enough to attend an event yesterday with the authorities from uh, People's Committee talking about what is the future of, of Ho Chi Minh City. And it, it's, it's enormously exciting. They, they want to make it into a sort of regional hub for entrepreneurs. They want to make it into a regional hub for artists. They want to make it into a regional hub for musicians. Because Ho Chi Minh has one thing that a lot of cities don't have. And that is a young Vietnamese population. So the Vietnamese are very energetic entrepreneurial people and then you take the young element into it so you get this uh, incredible um, energy that we see uh, throughout the country. And just for, for those listening from abroad or not in Ho Chi Minh City, how, how big is that young population exactly? Everyone says it's the demographics are really uh, the biggest cards that mm -hmm. the economy has to play. Maybe you can paint a picture of how large that, that group is and what are they up to these days? So uh, look, I, I don't have the exact number, um, but all indications are that it's sort of 60, 70 percent of the population is under the age of 30. Mm -hmm. and, if, and if I take my own organization, yeah. the average age in HSBC Vietnam is 29 years of age. Uh, I'm sure it'd be lower than that if you took me out of the mathematical equation, but it's a very young uh, organization. And what I find is that they are outspoken. Mm -hmm. They have a voice, they want to be heard, they will step up for a challenge, and in some ways they push me. Um, and, I, and I find that very invigorating that they want to succeed, they want tomorrow to be better than yesterday. And that doesn't just happen in my organization, it's happening across the economy, despite COVID. And I think the other thing that you have to throw into that is the unbelievable resilience of, of the Vietnamese people. Um, having managed them through this crisis, or managed together with them through this crisis, People don't complain. People just get on with it. So I, 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 I'm hugely positive on the economy. I think the young are going to really drive this country forward. And um, good times are about to start again. Speaking of tomorrow, Tim, uh, everyone's talking about these buzzwords, especially with COP26 uh, just finishing up uh, quite a bit a while ago here. Um, what do you think Vietnam has to do about sustainability? about climate change um, and innovation regarding that. Why is it such a big issue to, for Vietnam to face and confront today? Well, for starters, Ho Chi Minh is probably one of the cities that's most susceptible to global warming. And if we don't do anything about global warming by 2030, so eight, nine years from now, you and I would be sitting with a snorkel and a mask here because Ho Chi Minh would be underwater. Mm -hmm. If you look at Vietnam more broadly, so beyond Ho Chi Minh City, the World Bank indicates that Vietnam's top five country susceptible to the damages of climate change. And you only have to look at last year, the flooding that we had in the central provinces. 
or Muine, I, I regularly go there with my family. I mean, the beach just seems to get smaller every time we're there. Um, or you go down to the mangrove forests in the bottom of the Mekong Delta. So climate change is real. And climate change is not something that is country specific. It doesn't know borders. Mm. So yes, Vietnam has to do something about it. And Vietnam is in a very fortunate position that it has huge natural resources. It has hydroelectric power. It has solar power. It has the ability to harness wind power because of its 2,000, 3,000 kilometers of coast and fairly shallow seabed, which means it's cost effective to do, to do uh, wind power. But we have to go beyond Vietnam. This is, this is a global issue. So, and that is why COP26 was so important to bring everyone together and get everyone to agree to it. Because if one country does something, it's not enough. Everyone has to do it. And why is it a now or, or never? Uh, you know, during the COP26 uh, convention, I believe the target was 1.5 Celsius or two mm. in that range. And I saw a bunch of different graphs. People were saying, you know, we need to achieve this level of mm. commitment, uh, particularly financial, in order to hit that target. And, and COP26 fell short of that. Mm. Um, in your opinion, at one of the leading financial institutions uh, here in Vietnam, but HSBC globally as well, mm. uh, why is it that now or never position for you guys uh, in terms of this climate change? So I don't think it's now or never for, for us guys. I mm. think it's now or never for us as, as humanity. Yes. Uh, and the reason for that is for too long, all of us have kicked the can down the road. Mm. And there's a realization that I think it's since the 1700s, the world has heated up by about one and a half degrees. And there's been more natural disasters linked to weather in the last 10 years than any other time. Mm. And you just have to see what's happening with typhoons, hurricanes, flooding, etc., which is driven by this climate change. And I think we're in a position now where we can actually make concrete steps because the technology is there to allow us to make a change in our lifestyles. And, and we all have to do it. And, it. and it's small steps, right? It starts with my kids no longer wanting a plastic straw, all the way to banks financing a large electric vehicle plant. But everyone has to move in that direction and every little bit counts. We can't just wait for the big bang and it all gets resolved. The same way erosion happens gradually, which is caused by climate change, and you don't realize until it's too late, it, the same way we can take lots of little steps and together make a big difference to the future. So the globe can take a big step, the society can take a big step. Let's hone in on financial institutions, your role at HSBC. What can you guys do? You mentioned financing the next energy efficient power plant. Yeah. Um, let's break that down a little bit. What, what are you guys doing here in Vietnam in particular? So, so we're doing a whole raft of things. What am I doing personally? Um, I have asked that they install solar paneling on the house that I live. Uh, I think that if you want change, and I think it was Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in others. So that has been my commitment that I will do that because I, I want to show my kids, but also my team that it's important. But as a bank, we have to help our customers get on the journey of becoming more environmentally sensitive. And a lot of that will be around innovation and change. And there will be a cost associated with that. And therefore, banks will have to play their part in helping that happen. And what we're seeing is that banks can help. Investors are demanding it now of the companies. Employees are demanding it of the companies. And so there's a lot of pressure on everyone to conform, um, which is good. So what, what have we done? We have launched the first green deposit in the country, which is if you are a corporate or an individual and you feel that the deposit that you place in the bank should only be used for the benefit of a green project, we have one of those green deposits and actually two large multinational customers have placed their deposits into that. Is this good business for you guys to be practicing, you know, climate kind of uh, being proactive about implementation of these practices, or is it more of a face? Because a lot of people say, especially early on, you know, now there's massive investment going in, but, but is it actually good for the business? I'm curious. So my personal view is yes, because what's good for society at large and good mm. for the planet is good for the business. Um, and we have to do it. It's, it. it's not an option. As I said at COP26, 
we can keep talking about it, but now's the time for action. And so whether it is helping VinPearl, for example, do the first exchangeable sustainable bond in the world, not just in Vietnam, in the world, and we actually had to upscale it because when we went to the investment community outside Vietnam and said, we've got this green project in Vietnam, everyone said, I'm in. So the investors are looking for green assets. There is a demand for investors to place their money into green assets. And we're seeing a lot of Vietnamese companies now coming forward and saying, HSBC, you have helped in other jurisdictions. It might be slightly ahead of us, but because you operate in over 60 countries, you have this ability. Help us create our own sustainable finance framework, our own green framework to ensure that we're playing our part in this as well. And I mean, we worked with one company called Zuitan Plastics, where we helped them do the first plastics recycling plant here in Vietnam. So the good thing, I think, is that the Vietnamese corporates realize it's important. The good thing is that at top of house in Vietnam, Prime Minister Chin was at COP26 and made a very bold statement that Vietnam has to get on board. So the sense I get is that Vietnam is driving this. And from my experience of learning about Vietnam and its history, when Vietnam decides to do something, it makes it happen. Hey guys, so you've made it about halfway through the first episode of a three-part special series that we're doing with HSBC Vietnam. It's part of a special series format of Vietnam innovators that I want to do a lot more, which is to bring on some of the biggest names in Vietnam business to have them share about their ideas and thoughts about the challenges and opportunities facing Vietnam's future. And in today's case, it's about sustainability. I'm really grateful to the sponsor of today's series that really made everything possible for Vietnam innovators. And again, that's HSBC Vietnam. So big kudos to these guys for really pushing the message and spreading the word to our audience about sustainability. So big thanks to HSBC Vietnam. HSBC has been in Vietnam for 151 years. Throughout those years, they've been focusing on their strengths, such as international connectivity, innovation, and sustainability, to open up a world of opportunity to internationalists in Vietnam. And we're really excited that we share that mission with them. So guys, if this is interesting to you and you want to continue supporting our mission, smash the like button, subscribe to the YouTube channel, Spotify, Apple Podcast, wherever you're getting today's message. And that'll help us bring more guests like Tim Evans from HSBC onto today's show. Now let's get back to the episode with Tim to hear more about him from HSBC, sustainability, and what the future of climate change is like in Vietnam. That's a very big statement to make. Um, and it's exciting to hear that there's lots of examples, particularly within the ecosystem of HSBC, even outside of the ecosystem. Is it enough? Are we, are we seeing enough companies rally behind that? Look, I, I think what starts is that the big companies start doing it and the smaller ones fall in suite, uh, fall, in, fall into step. And so there is a very strong push by the larger corporates in the country to do that. Uh, the stock exchange actually has a sustainability index mm. and has had it since 2017, which oh, I think is a really right. positive step, which identifies companies based on their mm. involvement and commitment to sustainability. But what will happen is I think you'll get the big companies pushing and you'll get the SMEs and the MMEs who may not at the moment have the financial wherewithal to do the investment to become green following suite. And that's where banks like us, but also the domestic banks, have to work to support them on that journey. And this leads me to my next question about the green market in general, particularly in Vietnam. Everywhere I go, it could be Queen Yun, it could be in Saigon, it could be somewhere in the north, you see all these windmills. Uh, solar panels everywhere. And it makes me think that Vietnam really is a leader in this, but where is it really? I mean, is it as mature as we as it should be given um, kind of the investment that's already made into it? Um, what's the public's perception of the green market for sustainability and all these buzzwords? Like a lot of our staff, and again, perhaps the same with HSBC, you know, uh, a lot of our staff are, are white collar folks working mm -hmm. in the city. Um, they see uh, the impact on the news and all that. Are they practicing it in general? So a two-part question. First, right. green market, is it really where it should be? And is it mature enough? Um, is there room to grow? And not only on the business side, but on the consumers as well. So is it as big as it appears? Yes. And if you look at solar energy and wind energy, my understanding is that Vietnam is a leader in this space across ASEAN. Can it keep growing? Absolutely. 
Does it need to keep growing? Absolutely. Are people aware of it? Absolutely. And one of the positives to come out of COVID is that we've all seen pictures of the world where it was regenerate nature was regenerating itself because people weren't traveling, people weren't polluting. And I think that has piqued the interest of a lot of people that maybe we just need to press the pause button and think about what we're doing to this planet. And, and I remember myself, I, I came in a couple of times during the lockdown to, to my office and we're right by the, the cathedral and walking out at lunchtime and just seeing doves sitting on the road mm. was magical uh, as opposed to a sort of cacophony of noise from motorbikes going past. So... Vietnam has made big strides. There is more to do. There is a lot more to do, but at least it started the journey. Yeah. Every journey starts with a small step, and I believe Vietnam has already taken that step. Um, and there's a lot of pressure from the youth in Vietnam that are sort of, and I, and I see it with my own children, because they're very uh, environmentally aware, saying, you know, Dad, you shouldn't do that. Dad, you shouldn't get a plastic bag. And I'm seeing that much more broadly. And I think that that young population will also act as a catalyst mm to push the country towards a more sustainable future. Excellent. Yeah, I, I get the same feeling. I mean, on my Facebook feed, Instagram feed during the lockdown, um, so many people were commenting, oh my God, the only silver lining of this lockdown is that we can see the skies, we can see the birds, we can, um, it's quiet, you know, yeah. all these different um, kind of silver linings, I guess you could say about, yeah. particularly the environment. So people are thinking about it. Practice happening gradually. Um, even our own market research, we, we run quite a few columns on Viet Cetera about uh, perceptions yeah. and actions related to it. Action being the lagging indicator, of course, and perceptions very high, uh, enough to make an Instagram story. Um, mm -hmm. As for the actions, lagging, but that's, you know, I guess that's the reality, right? It takes time to not only educate, but really permeate across different audiences, not just the folks that have the views in the office tower that can see the skies every morning, right? I think it, it also boils down to um, people working in the economy and, and that impacts like, you know, farmers, that impacts um, people working uh, out in the ports. You know, there's so many elements at play, um, uh, but also here in the city, of course. So it's, it's great to hear your opinion about that. Um, I'd love to hear about um, what you can do to encourage your colleagues uh, to follow this net zero path. All right, do you guys have incentives at the company? Are you encouraging actively you know, your, your colleagues to, to go through this? Are there activities that you guys are running? So all of the above. Uh, HSBC has made a commitment that we aim to lend between 750 billion and a trillion dollars mm. to help the world on its sort of ratio. No, no oh, dollars, globally. no, no, dollars, okay, globally. Like... <laughs> no, certainly not dumb. Um Globally, and that, that's, a, that's a firm commitment by yeah. HSBC. Oh, we, we, we need to be part of the solution, right, right mm -hmm. as a bank. And here, domestically, we have set ourselves aspirational internal targets that we need to try and get to a position where 30% of the loans that we originate or, mm -hmm. or, or, or give to companies is for a green purpose. Mm -hmm. But it's a lot more than that. Um, you know, electronic lights that switch themselves off at 5.30 at night. Mm -hmm. um, one of the byproducts of COVID is that less people are in the office, right? We, we now operate where roughly 30% of our people work from home on a rotational basis, which means we've been able to give up some floor space, which means less air conditioning costs, which means less people traveling. So there's a number of steps that, that we can take. Um, but it starts with us as an individual, right? And if I can model the way in some of the ways that I come to work, I try and travel less by plane because of the carbon footprint that that leaves. I have solar power on the roof of my house. Um, I come to school now, I uh, come to school. I come to the um, office with a lunchbox, the same way my kids go to school. It used to be a plastic We're bag. all learning about this still, so, so, so we're, we're all, um, <laughs> and we've done quite a fair bit on the um, corporate sustainability side with our teams. Sadly with COVID, we haven't been able to go to the communities and help, but we have paid for the, um, I guess you call it reforestation of the mangrove forests mm. in the south of the country, because that not only stops erosion, but it also creates more um, sea life um, in the rivers, which also has an economic benefit on the communities down there. Mm. So given we were 150 years old last year, we committed to do 150 hectares of additional mangroves 
um, which as a team we would go down there and help, but sadly this year we haven't been able to do it, but we're doing it in conjunction with WWF. And there's a number of other projects that we do. And as soon as it's safe for us to travel domestically, then we, we do a lot more of those activities just to raise the profile of how important it is. Amazing. Well, you know, uh, commenting about the whole sustainability, climate change thing, uh, et cetera, and we'd love to, to perhaps invite your team to work with us. We're developing a Generation Z white paper mm -hmm. very soon. So it's the first edition coming out next year uh, where we talk about what's, it's, a, it's like a state of the union address yeah. per se, um, about what is the state of Gen Z in Vietnam every single year. And, and this year we're gonna do it in the first half of the year where we ask young people using our, our, our website and our channels, what are their opinions, not only about sustainability, climate change, but whatever else impacts them, education, learning, um, what they like to drink, what they like to eat, um, their take on the most famous celebrity that they're really idolizing these days. Um, and, and, and not just singers and celebrities, but also uh, those working in education or um, science and whatnot. Um, and I think this is a very important um, kind of scene to highlight. I think uh, the numbers quite, quite, quite aren't quantified quite yet. And you know, talk about the mangrove tree uh, initiative. Um, I didn't know about that. Um, that's nice to know, and more people should know about it. Uh, but yeah, it's also a communication kind of priority, I guess you could say. Um, how can we really push that narrative? Instead of just saying these things, how could we share more about it? That's gonna be also a big uh, kind of key for us. A lot of the activities that we do around corporate sustainability and helping people who've suffered during COVID is not done as a marketing ploy mm. and is not done as a brand awareness ploy. It is done because it is genuinely the right thing to do. And so the mangrove activities that we've done in the South we've deliberately tried not to make it a big promotional item because then people could perceive it as this is a large corporate doing mm -hmm. it for the halo effect yes. of doing this. And that's not what we're after. Mm. Sometimes you have to do what's right because it's right. That's a great statement. Uh, for those of you deciding whether or not to recycle, do what's right <laughs> uh, at the very small level. But of course, uh, we hope to see the greater ecosystem in Vietnam adopt these practices really think about climate change at not only the small level, but the big level. And even if it's not good for business now, it will be in the future, especially if you're investing in it to be one of the first. So Tim, thank you for joining today's show. Well, if I may just say one thing, there yes. is a cost to not doing this. There is a cost, yes. The cost is that if Vietnam does not address, and I just use the Vietnamese context, but there's a cost on a global level. We believe it's about three and a half percent off GDP. So you're talking three and a half, four billion dollars of lost output because we don't get on the bandwagon of... Is that globally Brazil. or...? No, that's just the Vietnamese economy. Right. So it's, it's very real mm -hmm. that if we don't do it, there's also a cost. So actually, it's not we save cost by not doing it, mm -hmm. we incur cost by not doing it. Right, so. right. That's a good distinction to make. Uh, Tim, thank you for joining the show. Thank you for having me. Sure. It's, uh, it's been a privilege and, of course, being our first guest back in the studio, uh, it's always a welcome kind of message to hear about something good for the world, sustainability, uh, innovation, climate change, and, and one of the leaders in that. So thank you, Tim. Uh, we hope to have you back on the show, perhaps in the, in the future, or one of your colleagues to hear more. Um, for those of you listening to Vietnam Innovators, this is the show uh, with Tim Evans. You can, leave it, you can hear it anywhere on our channels, on our website, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube. Every Tuesday, we have a new episode that drops. So look out for the next one. Tim Evans, CEO of HSBC Vietnam. We'll see you guys next time. Thanks, Tim. Thank you very much. Check out the Vietnam Innovators series on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And don't forget to subscribe to listen to other innovative stories in Vietnam. Hey guys, good news. Vietcetera has now officially rolled out a mobile app for Android. Now you can download our mobile app on both the Apple iOS store and the Google Play store right now. More functions are coming very soon, so stay on the lookout.